Howdy. Howdy. I love it. It doesn't, it never gets old. Uh, well, if we haven't had the chance to meet, um, like Jack said, my name is Drew and I live in San Antonio, which is just down the road. Ah, yeah, very cool. Are you guys from there? Just heard of it. Okay, cool. Um, here, here's the question tonight that I, I want to pose to you and I. Um, the last three weeks, I mean, you guys had TA and Ben Stewart, JP was here last week and noticing there's, there's been this kind of theme that's run through each one of the messages and it was this, this focus of intimacy with Jesus and what it looks like to really walk with him and know him deeply. Well, tonight I wanna to talk about what happens if you really do step into that intimacy if you really do trust and believe Jesus. And what I mean by that is not just in theory, not just in philosophy, not just in an idea, not just some box that you check and you're like, yeah, yeah, I prayed a prayer one time. I got my golden ticket to heaven. I'm good. No, no. Like you actually know him and you actually walk with him. What could actually happen in you and through you for the sake of those around you? Because I, I don't know if you're like me, but ever since I was little, I've had that question of I feel like I was made for something more. I feel like I, I was created for something big. And, and the truth is, if you ask most little kids like what they want to be when they grow up, like when I was a kid, it was like, I wanna be a doctor or, or, or I wanna be, um, it was like a, a fireman or a police officer. Now, it was all about impact. Like I, I, wanna, I wanna change the world. I wanna make it a little bit better. Like I wanna help people. Now today, sadly, you ask most teenagers and kids what they want to be as they grow, when they grow up. It's like, I wanna be a YouTuber. Or I wanna be famous. Like, now, although that's a little sad, some of you are like, wait, that's me. That's what I wanna be. Uh, it's a little sad. Um, the truth is this, the same sentiment is there. I, I wanna live for something bigger, for something more. I, I want my life to matter. I want to have impact. And so the question tonight that I have for us, does the Bible have anything to say about that? Does Jesus care at all? And in, in Luke chapter 10, that there's this, this religious leader, this expert of the law that comes up to Jesus and he asks him this question. He says, Jesus, what, what will it take for me to, to grab a hold of eternal life? Now, most of us with our Western mind, we hear eternal life and we think, oh, he's, he's wanting to know what does he need to do to get into heaven? But that's not what he's asking. When he's asking for eternal life, he's going, no, no. What, what I want, Jesus, is how do I experience life and life to the fullest here? How do I have a life of impact? How do I experience the kingdom of God the way you intended it? Right here, right now. I don't want to waste my life. How do I do this? So Jesus asked him, he's like, well, what's, what's your interpretation of the Torah? The Old Testament. And he says, well, it really boils down to uh, the Shema, which every Jewish person would have known, that it's, it's to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind, like every fiber of your being. And then the second is to love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus looks at him and he's like, bingo. Like, that's it. That, that's the secret. We have a tendency to overcomplicate it. And you, and you got it right there. Like you, 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 you love Jesus and you pursue him, the intimacy with him, then guess what? Then the byproduct of you having intimacy with Jesus is you're gonna have impact on the world around you. That intimacy always precedes impact. To love the Lord with everything you got and then you love the people around you. But this expert of law, he, he's like, hey, uh, Jesus, I'm seeking to be justified. He's like, who's my neighbor? Riddle me this, Jesus. Now, he asks this question, and Jesus is going to pick it up, but I want you to see why he's asking it. 
This is, uh, he asks this question much like many of you that have maybe like, you're trying to follow Jesus and maybe you've started into like a dating relationship or maybe uh, you're just kind of exploring that. And every, almost every young adult, every high school student that's dating, this is the number one question that you get, especially uh, when it comes to like purity. It's this, Drew, how far is too far? Like what? Where's the line, Drew? How far can we go? Like, what am I allowed to touch before it becomes sinful? What am I allowed to kiss? Like, no, that's, that's the question, right? And you're like, oh, yeah, all of you, you've asked that question at some point. Now, what, what this expert of the law is he's asking is something very similar. He's going, Jesus, where's the line? Like, what am I allowed to get away with? Like, who really am I supposed to love? Who's the neighbor? And so then Jesus is going to tell a very, very famous story. And even if you have no church background, you've probably heard this before. And this is what he says. This is the story of the Good Samaritan. And so in Luke 10, verse 30, it says this. It says, Jesus took up the question. He's like, I'll I'll, I'll go to bat. And he tells the story. He says, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho and he fell into the hands of robbers. They stripped him, they beat him up and fled, leaving him half dead. The priest happened to be going down that road. When he saw him, he passed by on the other side. In the same way, a Levite, when he arrived at that place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan on his journey came up to him. And when he saw the man, he had compassion. He went over to him and he bandaged his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. And then he put him on his own animal, brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper and said, take care of him. And when I come back, I'll reimburse you for whatever extra you spend. Now, let me recap this story because I know many of us have heard it, but I want you to try to see this in new lens. Put yourself in the context of the story. That Jesus tells a story about there's this man who's who's leaving uh, Jerusalem. He's on his way to Jericho, very dangerous road. He gets hijacked, okay? He's beaten up. He's like stripped naked. He's left alone, half dead. Now there's there's a lot of symbolism there that we would have missed. What he's communicating is this, is this man was stripped of his clothes. He's he's been stripped of his dignity. Like this dignity has been ripped away from him. He's in pain, hurting, most definitely physically, but what about emotionally? He's left alone. There's no one there and he's half dead. Physically, yes. But what about emotionally? What about spiritually? I want before we even dive into this story to take a second and go, who comes to mind when you think about the people that surround you, that their dignity has been taken away from them because the color of their skin or the gender or the way they respond in the world? who's, Who's wounded? Who's hurting? Who's in pain? Who's alone and who's walking around half dead? And the truth is, we don't have to even leave the room to find those people. Many of us in this room, that's how we feel. Like we resonate at some level. And then Jesus, he's gonna go on and he's gonna tell this, this story about how there's these two religious leaders, there's a priest and a Levite, and they, they just totally ignore the man in the text. The mentality that they have is that I don't have to solve the problem if I act like I don't see it. It's this mindset that they did knock him down so they don't have the responsibility to lift him up. And the truth is love makes a commitment to help fix things even if they didn't help break them. I'll just say that again. True love makes a commitment to fix things even if they didn't break it. And I think honestly, like I used to read this text all the time and I I think the priest and the Levite get kind of a bad rap. 
Because the truth is many of you are like, hey, Drew, if I was leaving like tonight and walk by and there's somebody like on the side of the road in the median and they're like half dead and bloody and all alone, like I think I'd probably stop. But once again, we're making it to the physical. What about the emotional? Like I, I, I was thinking about this the other day is like, I'm, I'm kind of like preparing for this. I'm trying to wrap my mind around it. And, and I'm pulling up on, on my street. There's just like, you kind of come to the, the intersection and there's always, always like homeless people that are asking for money. And I find in my default setting is to switch lanes and to try to get in the middle. Uh, so you don't have to kind of interact. They have that social awkward interaction, right? Or If you like get stuck in that lane, you immediately, it's like 10 and two, stare forward, like don't make eye contact or like play on your phone, pretend like, oh, I'm super bad on the phone. Um, Right? Like don't judge me. Like I feel like you're like, oh, I would never. No, you do it too. Like we have that like default setting. Like we, we kind of like bypass, we see a person whose dignity has been stripped completely away from them. They're wounded, they're hurting. They're in so much agony. Like they're left half dead, they're alone but it's just so easy to just kind of bypass and be like, if I don't really see it, I don't actually have to deal with it. And my prayer for us tonight is this, that God, would you awaken us to the people that surround us? Would you awaken us to the people around us? Because the truth is this, this is how you're going to have impact. If you wanna follow Jesus, it's learning to live like Jesus in every moment. So I'm gonna make this super practical as we look at like, how do you have impact in the world, loving your neighbors? Please, please don't like just put this on the lower shelf and go, oh, this is so easy. Because the truth is the vast majority of us are doing a horrible job at this. So let's lean in just a little bit. What we see here in the text is four things. that are just super practical. There's a couple of other ones, but I'm just gonna zero in on four. And here it is. The first one is this. The first thing that you see that the Good Samaritan does is this, he sees the man, he sees him. So for us, we need to open our eyes. We need to to look. This Samaritan, he didn't see the origin of the robbery, but he saw the outcome of it. He saw this man beaten, bleeding and broken. And so often you and I, we can be consumed by our own world that we don't see our brothers and sisters around us hurting. And we have to open our eyes to see those around us. Just as a quick illustration, like I, I've noticed recently, like we, a lot of us, especially if we live in small towns, like we grew up in like a society that had front, front porches. And so much has like shifted, especially as you get into these bigger cities is everything moved to the backyard so that you don't have to see people. Like we, we used to sit on front porches and we would see all of our like literal neighbors and we'd get to know them and we'd know when they were out of town. But now it's kind of like, no, I wanna isolate myself. So we built garages so that we can, don't even have to like interact with people. We can just park our cars, go straight into the house. And so my wife and I got super convicted about this and we just took my daughter's swing and we took it out of the tree in the backyard and we literally just put it in our front yard. And we live on a corner so we could just interact with our neighbors as they walk past us or go on jogs. And we're just like, we just want to have eyes to see. And so the truth is it can be a small thing, but my question for you is, do you have eyes to see the world around you? Did you, did you struggle when I asked, like who, who, who is it that surrounds you that's their dignity has been stripped? Who is it that's around you that's hurting in pain right now? Because the truth is every one of us have people that are hurting around us. Like who is it that's alone? Who is it that's left half dead? Do we have eyes to see? So maybe for you, take a minute and just ask, write down, journal, who is coming to your mind when you think about those things? Who's popping into your head? The first thing that you see the Good Samaritan does is he, he, he sees. The second thing he does is that he shows compassion. It says that he has compassion. And so listen, that to the best of his ability, that this Samaritan is willing to enter into the pain with this man. The fact that he's hurting, it hurt him. And so I think the easiest way to do this, and this is gonna get super practical. Okay, you're like, come on, man, eyes to see. Yeah, yeah, I know, but so many of us, we don't do this. Like have eyes to see. The second thing, the easiest way to show compassion on people on a college campus is this. Learn to listen. 
The greatest tool you have in this day and age to love people is the power of a question. Ask the question and then wait and listen to what they say, to what they share, what's going on. It is the greatest, easiest thing, but the truth is we have lost this art and somewhere maybe through technology or just, I don't know, we just, we were talking about this on the way here. We just lost the art of just sitting and eating and drinking and just listening to people. Like we, we've, you've grown up in a culture that kind of gave you a cell phone and a social media platform and just said, share your voice all the time to everyone and no one all at the same time. Like your voice is all that matters. And so we've gotten caught up in this constant chatter and we just stopped listening. We stopped actually caring for people. So do you have eyes to see and do you show compassion? And the easiest way to do this is to listen because real talk, you can't show compassion if you never actually see a person. And it is very possible to hand someone a $20 bill on the side of the road and never really see them. And never really see them. So open your eyes, show compassion. The third thing is this man was super intentional, super intentional. He went to where the man was, like he deviated, like deviated from his normal program or path to enter into someone else's space. So once again, super practical. Where are your neighbors? Where do they hang out? Go there. If you want to love people the way that Jesus loved them to have impact, go where they are. Simply put, supporting like support sporting events or club function, functions of groups that are maybe different than yourself. I mean, check into like the dorm activities, things that are going on, or apartment socials, or go to on-campus activities with intentionality. Like this is actually can be a lot of fun. Like going to backyard barbecues that you get invited to like to actually go to them. Or listen, if you're like, they're not throwing a barbecue, throw your own. Guess what, if you wanna like have impact and be a good neighbor, like guess what, this Sunday, everybody is looking for a party to hang out at. Literally everyone, every one of your neighbors, every one of the people that God has sent you to, to love, to have impact with, they're looking for something to do. And you're like, you know what? Hey, I bought a bunch of hot dogs. We're gonna put them on the George Foreman grill. We're gonna show the game, come on. And then just be intentional, ask good questions, lean in, listen to what they share. And here's the deal. If you love Jesus, don't miss this. This is unbelievable. If you love Jesus in this space, the moment that you like went all in, Texas Hold'em style, push the chips in like, Jesus, my life is yours, you can have it. The God of the universe chose to take up residence inside of you. And so if you're walking with him, if you're being intimate with him, then all of a sudden you invite people that don't know them into your life or you step into their life and you're being, and you're being sensitive to the spirit and where he's leading and you just ask good questions, lives will be changed. We have made this so stinking complicated. Most of us, when we think about really loving our neighbors, you know what we think? Uh, I get really nervous about that, Drew. Why? Because aren't we supposed to like sell Jesus like he's a vacuum cleaner and I go door to door knocking like, oh, I got to get this like quota. I got to sign you up here. And you want to give your life to Jesus? I got to just pray this prayer. And it's super weird. And I'm like, yeah, stop being weird. <laughs> like nowhere in the scripture do you see that. You just see to see people, to show compassion and to be intentional. And to be honest, we've been like, ooh, but that's messy. It's just easier to drop a track at their front door and walk away, just, or to invite them to break away, right? Like we're just, we're just trying to drum up business for Jesus, right? No, no, as you walk with Jesus, the whole goal of this is you're just inviting others to walk alongside you as you walk with him. And in the end, they get Jesus. Why? Because that's where you're headed. But it takes intentionality. The fourth thing, real quick, is this. 
look to serve. That this man uses his resources, his ability, his influence to make this li- the life of this person better. Like he's like, man, he's practical good news. Like takes oil and wine, bandages, puts him on his donkey and takes him to an inn, stays the night with him, probably in the same room with him. Like, I mean, just thinking about the practical resources that God has given you. Like, don't jump just to finances. Think your time. Think maybe, yeah, your treasure, but what about your talent? What about your space? What about your car? Like ways that you can actually leverage opportunities to serve and love those around you. Uh, One of my good friends in San Antonio, he's a pastor, and his name's Izzy. And if you ever hang out with Izzy, he, like every coffee shop he goes to, like every barista knows him. Like they all call him by name. Like you walk in with him like, Izzy, and they're like high five in. You're like, man, what is up? Like, how do you know everybody? And I just asked him and he sat down and he said, man, he said, I just learned to see the baristas. And he goes, I just started asking them questions. Like, how's your day? And then I paused to actually listen and not be quick to share what about my day, but I just wanted to listen about their day. And he said, you know what I noticed? He said, a lot of these baristas that have morning shifts don't get to eat. And so they would make comments like, ah, you know, it's been tough and exhausted, starving. So the next day I just brought breakfast tacos. And listen, Izzy's a pastor. And if you talk to any of these baristas, hey, just real talk, they all think that Christians are super weird. (laughs) They think you're super weird. Because you're like, hey man, I'm trying to work here. You're trying to like share the gospel with me. Why can't you just see me and maybe love me? And Izzy's had this opportunity to share the gospel with so many people in the city just because he takes the moments to stop, to see, to lean in, to show compassion, be intentional, and looks for opportunities to serve. Be in it for the long haul. I love it when he says, when I come back. One of the, as I was thinking about this, I had this really sobering moment where I began to realize that most of my neighbors, like literal neighbors who don't know Jesus, are better neighbors than I am. Many of them are better at this than a lot of Christians I know. For example, uh, Mr. Gary lives three houses down and he lives alone. He's in his late 60s. He works like 70 hours a week as just a handyman. And he lives with, with his five dogs and he takes them walking. And every year he remembers my daughter's birthday and buys her a gift. If we have a problem, he's the first to come. Like literally the other day, he fixed our sink for free. And when my wife, when we came home from the hospital, after being in the NICU, Mr. Gary bought my wife uh, a coupon or I guess a, a gift certificate just to go get a massage. And he said, I know life's been hard. He has no idea who Jesus is. Our neighbors right across the street, Joe and Heather, every time they have a barbecue, we get the text message to come over. The other day I was out of town and Jane's, you know, pushing the stroller with Lyndon and Tilly and in the front yard, Tilly just no nap, just has a meltdown. And Joe, he's in the backyard fixing something. He hears Tilly and he just runs across the street and kind of picks up my daughter and helps Jane get into the front door and then settles down. Because somehow Joe has learned to have eyes to see. He's learned to show compassion He's learned to be intentional and he has served our family so well. And the truth I know is that the Worshams are not a convenient family to love, but Joe and Heather never act inconvenienced, never. Here's the truth. To have impact and to be a good neighbor is learning to invite 
someone that you are uncomfortable with closer than you are comfortable with for you to have impact and be the good neighbor that God has called you to be. It is inviting someone that you are uncomfortable with closer than you are comfortable with. This religious leader at the end of the story is, he's just looking for the to-do list. How far is too far? And at the end of it, Jesus kind of throws it. He goes, okay, well, which, which of these three? Was it the priest, the Levite, or, or the Samaritan? Which one proves to be the good neighbor? And the truth is, the expert of law, he, he won't even say the word Samaritan because the Jewish people hated the Samaritans. This would be the equivalent of Jesus today walking up here and being like, hey, there was this like pastor and then there's this priest and then there's this pedophile that does this. Or there's this Taliban member. Like to immediately, everyone in the, in the culture steps back and is like, no, not the Samaritan. The, 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 this expert of the law won't even say the word Samaritan. He's like the one, the one that showed him kindness. And Jesus says, go and do the same. Why that's important, don't miss this. The religious leader goes, hey, how far am I called? I really wanna have impact. I really wanna live like Jesus. Where's the line? And Jesus looks at him and says, who's the person that you have the hardest time loving. That's your neighbor. Who's the person when you think of, that would be the hardest that popped into your mind. That's your neighbor. I think about it. Some of you, you're like, ah, immediately went, went into my mind. Someone in the trans community, someone of this color skin, someone of this sexual orientation, someone that voted for Trump, someone that voted for Biden. Like you just, you can make this list and immediately there's people that you get uncomfortable with. And maybe it's the people that actually literally live across the street or maybe across the hall. But who is it that immediately go, not them. Jesus is going, yes, that's your neighbor. If you want to live like me, if you want to look like me, if you want to have impact in this world, and yes, you love me with every fiber of your being, and then you go after and you love the people that are the hardest for you to love. The problem is that many of us, when we've read this story in the past and maybe even tonight, we all project ourselves into the story and most of us, we project ourselves as the good Samaritan. The truth is tonight that you and I are not the good Samaritan in the story. That you and I are the half dead person on the side of the road. That every single one of us, because of the sin in our lives have been stripped of dignity, wounded, left alone and spiritually half dead. And Jesus is the good Samaritan in the story, not you and I. Because Jesus, we see in Isaiah 53, is despised, rejected, just like the Samaritans. And the truth is that Jesus, listen, the whole story, the whole narrative of this book, do not miss it from front all the way to the end is this, is that you and I, that at one point in our lives, we looked at God and said, thank you, but no thanks, I can do this on my own. That you and I, we committed treason against God. We pushed him away. We stepped onto the throne of our life and we said, let us, let's take, take a shot at this. And in that moment, man, sin entered the world and it fractured every part of it. And every one of us, like, let's be honest, like you feel the effects of that. Like you feel the weight of that. But the whole book is one giant promise. And here's the promise that God looks at you and he sees you. He sees you in all of your brokenness. He knows every part of you and he loves you. And he showed compassion towards you that he was willing to be intentional, that he would leave his throne room and come to planet earth, wrap himself in human flesh in the person of Jesus that he would be willing to live the life that you and I could not live, die the death that you and I deserved. 
and was placed onto a cross and then into a tomb. And then three days later walks out of the grave, served us to the point of death on a cross. And then three days walks out of the grave, proving that he has the power over sin and death. And he did all of that to pick up your half dead body and to place it onto himself, to bandage your wounds, to bring you back to life so that you would walk in that love and that intimacy. And then hear these words, now go and do the same. If you do not realize that it is by grace and grace alone that you've been rescued and redeemed, bought with blood, and your identity is now a son or daughter of the king of the universe. And what has been afforded to you is the opportunity to walk in intimacy with him. Then you will never have the kingdom impact that you're supposed to have. And instead, you'll be the Levite and you'll be the priest just trying to make it through life, just trying to take care of your own. I didn't start that problem, it's not mine to deal with. I didn't push them down, I don't have to pick them up. And you'll just kind of make your way all the way to the end and find out that maybe you didn't truly live for all that you were created to live. But Jesus multiple times goes, hey, you wanna know what the good life, what it's all about? You wanna know this thing that you seek? If you really wanna leverage your time on college, this college campus in Aggie Land, if you wanna leave with no regrets, it really boils down to just this. Love me with everything you got and then go love your neighbors like I taught you to. That's it. That's all it is. Insanely easy to talk about. Really messy to do. So tonight, I'm not quite sure what God's doing in your heart. I don't know what he's speaking to you. Maybe tonight, God is bringing the names of people and you need to journal them down. You need to start praying for them. You need to open your eyes and look for opportunities to love them, to invite them close, ask good questions and just learn to be a good friend. Who is that? Who's that for you? Who popped into your mind? It may be the spirit prompting. Don't, please don't ignore that. Zero in on that. Listen, if you walk away tonight and you're like, that was a really cute message, Drew. Cool, thanks, man. Thumbs up. But it doesn't change you at all tomorrow. Like you're no more loving tomorrow. Then can I just be really honest with you? This was a giant waste of our time. But I pray tonight that you heard his voice and he's putting people on your heart and that you would step into that. You would begin to love people well. Or maybe tonight you realize, oh man, I'm the half dead person. And Drew, I don't, I don't know Jesus the way you're talking about, but I, and tonight I need to. Then man, I encourage you, come find someone in the care team, grab somebody that, that you came with, that you're like, man, I know that you love Jesus. You walk with him, you love him deeply. Let's go grab some food after this and I need you to introduce me. to give you just space tonight for you just to sit with Jesus and just listen to him, if that's okay. Just I'm gonna give you two minutes for you to journal, for you to ask God, what are you speaking to me tonight? What are you whispering to my heart? And then how do I step into obedience? What are you asking me to do tonight? Texas A&M. Jesus 
took 12 teenagers, really 12 minus one, 12 teenage boys who believed these two simple truths with every fiber of their being. And he changed the world with them. He changed the world. I cannot even begin to imagine if just a handful of Aggies in the year 2022 said, I'll believe it, I'll step into it. This campus would be forever changed. Our state would be forever changed. This country would be forever changed. And I'm crazy enough to believe it could start in Aggieland. So take this time.